Every year, sometime between mid-October and mid-November, people in the city of Ayodhya in northern India start making thousands of clay lamps called diyas. Did I just say thousands of lamps? No, I mean hundreds of thousands of lamps. Lining them up in perfect rows along the banks of the Saryu River, waiting to be filled with oil and lit with fire. And it's an incredible view. In 2022, Ayodhya broke their own record with 1.5 million lamps, transforming the cityscape into a shimmering sea of lights. Why this sudden interest in lamps? Well, it's all because of Diwali, the festival of lights. Diwali is one of the most important festivals in India, celebrated across the whole country, and in fact celebrated all over the world in Indian diaspora communities. For example, it's an official holiday in Fiji, Guyana, Mauritius, Singapore, among others. It's a major festival for Hindus in particular, and today we'll be focusing primarily on how Hindus celebrate Diwali, though it's also celebrated by many Jains, Sikhs, and Buddhists as well. But what is Diwali all about? Diwali means different things in different regions, but two consistent features of Diwali are lights and some form of Vishnu defeating or overcoming darkness. We can see these themes in the name itself. Diwali is a contraction of the word Dipavali, which is what many people call the holiday today instead. This comes from the Sanskrit words meaning row of lights. As we saw in Ayodhya, the most ubiquitous and quintessential practice during Diwali is lighting lamps. As night falls, homes, temples, and public spaces are lit with thousands of them. This symbolizes the victory of light over darkness, good over evil, and knowledge over ignorance. We also see the symbolism of light defeating darkness in the timing of the festival. Generally speaking, Diwali season is actually a series of five festivals celebrated over the course of five days, with the climax on day three, the actual day of Diwali. This falls on the night of the new moon in the month of Kartika on the Hindu calendar. Because this is a lunar calendar, Diwali shifts around year after year on the Gregorian solar calendar, always between October and November. Because it's the night of the new moon, and thus the darkest night of the month, the themes of light and darkness are at the forefront. In the words of the anthropologist Indira Aramugam, lighting lamps is a luminous refutation of winter's gathering darkness, imminent chill, and swirling inauspiciousness. Now, not everyone celebrates all five days, and some of these days have different names and different customs depending on the community. India is very diverse, and Hinduism is very diverse, so there will always be exceptions, and I'll try my best to show the diversity of this festival throughout this video. But generally speaking, the first day of the festival is called Danteras. It's a big shopping day, considered by many to be an auspicious day specifically to buy gold or silver. Though it's also a big shopping day for consumer goods in general. Like Christmas in the US, Donteras noticeably boosts the Indian economy. Retailers ranging from jewelers to electronic stores often see huge spikes in their sales on this day. Donteras sets the tone for the following days of Diwali, emphasizing prosperity and well-being. Day 2 is called Naraka Chaturdashi, also known as Choti Diwali or Small Diwali. Especially in southern India, this day commemorates Lord Krishna and his consort Satyabhama defeating the malevolent king Narakasura, which we'll cover later. Prayers to the ancestors are also said on this day. In the build-up to the main Diwali day, people will clean and wash their houses, as well as decorate their homes and businesses with rangolis, decorative designs made from colored rice, sand, chalk, and flower petals. Some describe making rangolis as a deeply meditative process, considering how much focus is required to make them. The scholar of religion Vasudha Narayanan describes these preparations as an absolute frenzy, with people buying gifts for loved ones, stocking up on diyas, dressing up in new clothes, and of course, buying and eating a lot of food. One New York City baker who specializes in Indian sweets estimates that Diwali celebrations account for around 20% of his entire annual sales. Day 3 is the main Diwali day, also called Lakshmi Puja. Puja refers to Hindu worship directed toward a deity, and Lakshmi is the goddess of wealth and prosperity. For many Hindus, she's a central deity worshipped during Diwali. Many also worship Ganesh on this day, the remover of obstacles. It's believed that Lakshmi visits homes during Diwali to bless devotees with prosperity, so entrances are opened, decorated, and very well lit to welcome Lakshmi and her blessings into the household. The primary event is performing a puja for the goddess Lakshmi, either in your own house or going to the local temple. 
This involves chanting prayers to Lakshmi, asking for wealth, abundance, or career success, and placing items representing their specific request in front of the icons of Lakshmi and Ganesh. The puja concludes with an RT or song expressing gratitude to the deity. Celebrants also set off fireworks. Lots and lots of fireworks. In fact, there are so many fireworks in India that they've become a serious pollution concern in major cities. Seriously, when I was researching this episode, I needed to sift through literally dozens of articles on air quality and Diwali. More climate science research has been done on this holiday than religious studies research. Research with titles like Measurement and Distribution Pattern of N-Alkanes and Size Segregated Aerosols During Diwali Festival in Delhi, India. So apparently Diwali is a huge festival for climate scientists as well. Day 4 is particularly diverse both in what it's called and how it's celebrated by different Hindu communities. It's variously called Govardhan Puja, Bali Pratipada, or Anakut. Govardhan refers to a hill in the Indian state of Uttar Pradesh, a pilgrimage site made famous from Hindu mythology. According to the ancient Sanskrit text, the Bhagavata Purana, the storm god Indra grew angry with a village of cowherders for cancelling a special puja for him, and so he sent a devastating storm to destroy them. But according to the text, Krishna picked up Govardhan Hill with one hand and held it aloft just as easily as a child holds up a mushroom basically holding up a mountain as an umbrella during a rainstorm. Govardhan Puja thus celebrates Lord Krishna and especially in rural areas of India is linked with cowherders. Many will celebrate by making replicas of Govardhan Mountain or Krishna himself using cow dung, later spreading these sculptures on their fields as manure and a bringer of good luck. The other name of this day, Anakut, means mountain of food, referring to the primary way to observe the festival by offering a huge amount of food for Krishna. Here we see the food arrayed in a temple in Kolkata, India, with the image of Krishna at the center. The other name of this day, Bali Pratipada, refers to another myth from the Bhagavata Purana. This one about the king Bali, who had conquered the heavens and the earth. After his conquering, he vowed to grant any request made to him. So Vishnu appeared before Bali as a diminutive avatar Vamana, and asked Bali to give him only three footsteps worth of land. Bali agreed. This seemed to be a modest request after all. But then suddenly Vishnu expanded to a gigantic size, and in only two steps covered the earth and the heavens, the entirety of Bali's kingdom. Where should he put his third step? Well, Bali offered his head in humility, and Vishnu stomped him down into the netherworld to visit earth once a year on this day. The final day is Bai Duj, a day celebrating the bond between brothers and sisters. Traditionally, brothers will give gifts to their sisters, and sisters will pray a special blessing for their brothers. As I said though, Hinduism is very diverse, so you'll find a lot of local variations in how Diwali is celebrated, both in India and abroad. For example, especially in West Bengal and Bangladesh, Hindus celebrate Kali Puja, a festival honoring the goddess Kali that coincides with Diwali. Another example comes from the research of the anthropologist Indira Aramugam, which she conducted in rural Tamil Nadu. Although Diwali generally has a joyous vibe for many Hindus, she found that celebrations in this region are more somber. While there are still festive elements like fireworks and feastings, the people she interviewed in a small Tamil village told her that Diwali is for the dead. In other words, for them, it's a time of bittersweet revelry to commemorate their ancestors. Dr. Narayanan, who I cited earlier, describes that especially in South India among Tamil communities where she's from, it's customary to wake up early on the day of Diwali and take an oil bath. Though even with this diversity, she's noticed that there's been a trend toward increasing homogenizing a Diwali practice with the rise of mass media. So many local traditions, such as this oil bath tradition, have faded considerably. We also see diversity in how those oppressed by the caste system may view Diwali differently from those privileged by it. As we've seen with stories like Rama defeating Ravana or Krishna defeating Narakasura, major Hindu holidays almost always have some battle in which lightened divine beings called suras defeat malevolent divine beings called asuras, sometimes inaccurately translated as demons. But many caste-oppressed people invert this narrative, in which they empathize with the asura. For example, remember Vishnu defeating King Bali? This is often seen as Bali having gained too much pride and power, which compels Vishnu to descend to earth to put him in his place. But many caste-oppressed folks see Bali as one of their own, a generous king who was subjugated, dispossessed of his kingdom, and banished regardless of his generosity, and thus they take issue with the framing of light over darkness as a way that normalizes their oppression. 
As I mentioned before, Diwali in many respects is also a pan-Indian festival, regardless of religious affiliation, and religious minority communities celebrate their own versions. For Jains, Diwali commemorates the liberation of Mahavira, the 24th Tirthankara, or the spiritual teacher of Dharma for Jains. On this day, it's believed that he attained liberation from the cycle of birth and death in 527 BCE. Sikhs recognize the day as Bandi Shordivas, or the Day of Liberation. It commemorates the release of the Sikh Guru, Guru Hargobind, who was imprisoned by the Mughal Emperor. Guru Hargobind managed to free 52 Hindu kings and princes who were imprisoned with him. Now, scholars don't know the precise origins of Diwali. Most assume it originates from some sort of agricultural harvest festival in antiquity based on the timing of the festival in the autumn. But firm evidence for Diwali starts to emerge in the first millennium CE. A Sanskrit stage play dating to the 7th century CE called Nagananda briefly mentions a festival of the lanterns, which likely refers to Diwali. What's interesting is Nagananda is a mix of Buddhist and Hindu traditions, which suggests that Diwali was probably a pan-Indian tradition from its earliest origins. In the 11th century, the Persian scholar Al-Biruni mentions Diwali in his huge work on Indian culture, writing that during this festival, people dress festively, make presents to each other, and light a great number of lamps in every place. He also reports that the festival honors the goddess Lakshmi, who remains a main focus to this day for most Hindus. The mythological narratives associated with Diwali vary from region to region, but one of the most widely recognized stories, especially in northern India, links this festival to Lord Rama's return to his kingdom in Ayodhya. According to the ancient Indian epic called the Ramayana, Rama is exiled from his kingdom for 14 years, accompanied by his wife Sita. During Rama's exile, Sita is abducted by the malevolent King Ravana. In his quest to rescue her, Rama forms an alliance with an army of monkeys, a battle breaks out between the two sides, and eventually Rama is able to kill Ravana and rescue Sita. They then return victoriously to Ayodhya, ending Rama's exile. As the tradition goes, the citizens illuminated the city with rows of lamps to mark his return. This event is commemorated in Ayodhya each year as we saw at the start of this video. For others, especially in southern India, Diwali is associated with the legend of Lord Krishna and his consort Satyabhama defeating the malevolent king Narakasura. According to Book 10 of the Bhagavata Purana, Krishna cuts Naraka's elephant-mounted army to pieces before finally beheading Naraka himself. In both stories, the central theme is the triumph of divine righteousness, which mirrors the themes of Diwali celebrating light defeating darkness and good defeating evil. In recent decades, Diwali has become the defining Hindu festival in countries with growing Indian immigrant populations. Government-funded celebrations in major cities like London and Sydney have transformed it into a showcase for Indian culture, with music and dance shows and food markets. In the US, Diwali is also having a mainstream moment. And there's no better way to see that than its commercialization. Big name brands have started to pay attention. Each year you'll now see Diwali themed commercials from Coca-Cola or Target, and even helpful instructions from the Lego company on how to make your own Lego Rangolis. Local governments have responded as well. In 2023, New York City declared Diwali a school holiday, and the Pennsylvania government declared it as a state holiday. The Congresswoman Grace Meng, representing New York, has even introduced legislation to make it a federal holiday as well. All of this seems to be responding to the growing Indian American population. Between 1980 and 2019, the Indian immigrant population in the US increased by 13 times. Indo-Caribbean immigration also increased, with many people from Trinidad, Guyana, and Suriname moving to the US. This has made Diwali celebrations much more visible in American culture. And it's just one example of how this pan-Indian festival of lights has turned into a global phenomenon. If you'd like to learn more about Hinduism, then I really recommend the Hinduism Explained video by Kojito, a beautifully animated intro to Hinduism in just under 18 minutes. Not an easy mission to accomplish. And the best way to watch your favorite educational content creators is by watching them ad-free over on Nebula. Nebula is a streaming platform owned by and for independent creators. This means that when you watch a Nebula creator like myself or Kojito, you're directly supporting that channel. And when you sign up using my link in the description below, you not only get 40% off an annual plan, but a share of your money also goes directly to support religion for breakfast. So I really want to emphasize that word independent when I say independent creator, because because Nebula empowers us to make the content we want to make, regardless of whether or not the YouTube algorithm will show us favor, and regardless of whether or not we're being advertiser-friendly. 
Some great examples are Nebula Original Series, exclusive content you can find only on Nebula, Lindsay Ellis's latest video essay on the life and death of family-friendly Las Vegas, Real Life Lore's intense series on modern conflicts. These are high-budget projects that you can watch only on Nebula. You also get access to Nebula classes. These classes are a great way to get a behind-the-scenes look at how your favorite creator makes content. You have Jesse Alexander's class, How to Make a Real-Time History Video, NerdSync's class, How to Make a NerdSync Video. Basically, these are how-to guides for aspiring creators. Again, if you sign up using my link below, you can get access to both Nebula and Nebula classes for a 40% discount off of annual plans, which works out to be about $2.5 a month. Thanks, everyone. Hope to see you there.